Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at geologic time. So the next question we're going to address is how do we produce absolute ages for a rock? So absolute age dating, also referred to as numerical dating or radiometric dating, is a process that essentially allows us to produce a numerical age for a rock using radioactive decay. So this presentation is going to correspond to section 9.4 of your textbook. So how do we use radioactive decay to date a rock? Well, we know that radioactive elements are naturally unstable. So these are elements like uranium or thorium, and, and there are going to be different versions of the same element. So for instance, uranium has two you know, relatively common radioactive isotopes, uranium-235 and uranium-238. So these isotopes are naturally unstable, and they're going to break down through a process which would be referred to as decay. So if you have a, a mineral that contains these radioactive isotopes, what's going to happen? Well, in this diagram here, you can see we have row upon row of radioactive isotopes, and these are the green spheres. Now, the radioactive isotope that's going to be doing the decaying is referred to as the parent isotope. And what's going to happen is through radioactive decay, the parent isotope is going to change into the daughter isotope. Now the daughter isotope is stable. So in the case of uranium, what it will do is it will decay and eventually it will form lead. And lead is stable, so the, at that point the decay stops. So um, in order for this process to occur, obviously you need to have an unstable parent isotope, and this unstable parent isotope is going to decay to give us the daughter isotope. Now, what you'll notice when you look at this diagram is this process of taking the parent isotope and turning it into the daughter isotope is not changing the total number of atoms involved. So if you look, we have the same number of atoms in this diagram as we do in this diagram. All that's happening is that we are changing parent isotopes into daughter isotopes. The total number of atoms doesn't actually change, and that's going to be important later. Now, when we're talking about decay, we often refer to it um, as the rate of decay, and this is a constant for each isotope, and the value of the rate of decay for each isotope will be different. So some isotopes will decay quickly, some of them will decay in fractions of a second, while some of them will decay over periods of time of, of, periods of, time of billions and billions of years. So when we're talking about this process, we tend to use a term which we refer to as a half-life. So a half-life is the amount of time required for half of the parent isotope to turn into the daughter isotope. Now, the thing is, is every time you take this step, the amount of time required for one half-life is constant. It does not change. So in this diagram, what we can see here is let's, for argument's sake, say we have 1,000 elements of uh, atoms, sorry, of a radioactive isotope. So let's just say uranium. And we know the uranium is going to decay to lead. That's the daughter isotope. So initially here, we start off with 1000 atoms of our radioactive isotope, which is our parent isotope. And of course, we have zero atoms of our daughter isotope because no decur decay has occurred yet. Now, after one half-life, what's going to happen is 50% of the parent isotope is going to have turned into the daughter isotope. So after one half-life, we are going to have 500 atoms of the parent isotope left, but 500 atoms of the daughter isotope has now turned, parent isotope, sorry, has now turned into the daughter isotope. When we go to the next half-life, we are then going to lose half of this number here, the 500. So after two half-lives, we now have 250 atoms of the parent isotope left, and we now have 750 atoms of the daughter isotope. Now, if we add the numbers in this column together, and then if we add the numbers in this column together, or and then if we add the numbers in this column together, you'll see the total for each column is going to be the same. We still have 1,000 atoms. All that's happened is we've changed the parent isotope into the daughter isotope. Now, the key thing to remember is the amount of time it takes to get from the start to the first half-life and from the first half-life to the second half-life is exactly the same. So let's, for argument's sake, say it's three and a half billion years. So to go from here to the first half-life takes three and a half billion years. To get from half-life one to half-life two takes 3.5 
billion years. So you'll see it's a constant. So as long as we know how many parent isotopes we started off with, and then we take our sample and we measure how many daughter isotopes we formed, we can calculate if we have you know this many starting parent isotopes, how long will it take to form this many daughter isotopes? Because remember, the rate of decay is constant. And this is how we date minerals. It's a relatively simple process, but it's made difficult by the fact that the quantities of radioactive isotopes in the minerals that we're studying are very, very small. So they're only a fraction of the mineral in question. And so, of course, this means we need very accurate, very expensive scientific equipment to take these kinds of measurements. So the idea of getting a numerical age is actually a relatively straightforward process. So what common radioactive elements do we analyze as geologists? Well, one of the most common decays that we use is the decay of an isotope referred to as potassium-40. So potassium-40 is an isotope of potassium, and it's radioactively unstable, and it will break down to the element argon, which is actually over here. It's one of the noble gases. So potassium uh, argon dating is actually very, very helpful. We tend to use it for minerals like the micas, muscovite and biotite, for instance. Now, uh, the great thing is, is that argon being a noble gas, it doesn't go into minerals. So this means that when we analyze our crystal to actually find out how much argon is in there, we instantly know that any argon that we find must have formed due to the decay of potassium 40 because there was no argon in the crystal in the first place because argon's a noble gas it doesn't like to bond to other elements it prefers to just float along by itself so we know therefore how much argon is in our sample and we know how much potassium 40 is in our sample so if we add the amount of potassium 40 from the sample that we analyze and the amount of argon from the sample that we analyze and we add them together that of course tells us the amount of potassium 40 that we started with because remember, all we're doing is we're taking the parent isotope and we're turning it into the daughter isotope. The total number of isotopes never changes. We're just converting one to the other. And so this means, let's say that we, are, we analyze our crystal of our mineral, let's say biotite, and we discover that there are, uh, let's say, 10,000 atoms of potassium in it, and we discover that there are 10,000 atoms of argon in it. Well, in that case, we can add the two together, and we know that we initially started off with 20,000 atoms of potassium-40. And so we know how much potassium we started with. We know how much argon we have in our sample now, which is 10,000 atoms. And so all we have to do is do a relatively simple calculation to work out how long it would have taken for 10,000 atoms of the potassium-40 to turn into 10,000 atoms of argon. It's a very simple process on the face of it. Now, another type of dating mechanism which we use is referred to as rubidium-strontium dating. And this is quite commonly used with minerals like feldspar, and it's especially used, uh, especially helpful for samples that are very, very old. And so we tend to use rubidium-strontium dating quite a lot when we actually date meteorites. So another dating method sometimes used by geologists is carbon-14 dating. And carbon dating is very, very helpful to geologists because it allows us to date material which we would otherwise not be able to. So the thing about dating methods like potassium argon, rubidium strontium and uranium lead is that they're good for dating minerals. The problem is, is if you're trying to date any kind of organic material, so let's say uh, an animal's uh, muscle tissue or let's say a piece of wood, for instance, it, you can't use any of these methods. So when you're dealing with organic material, the only method you can really use is carbon-14 dating. And of course, carbon-14 is a naturally unstable uh, radioactive isotope, and it will break down to give a daughter isotope of nitrogen. So the interesting thing about carbon-14 dating is, is that as carbon-14 has a relatively short half-life, about five and a half thousand years, it means that the amount of carbon-14 in the sample will very quickly decrease. And this means that after about 50,000 years or so, the amount of carbon-14 left in your sample is too low to accurately measure. And so this means that carbon dating can only really be used if your sample is 50,000 years or younger in age. Now, you can 
sometimes uh, date material which is older than 50,000 years using carbon dating. However, in order to do that, you need to have a very large sample size. And typically, if you are dating something that's over 50,000 years old, you normally don't want to destroy a large amount of the material you're, you're sampling. And so typically you won't have the kinds of volume, of, the kind of volumes of material required to produce an age for material which is older than 50,000 years. So carbon-14 dating is extremely helpful for organic material only, but it does come with the caveat that you can only really use it to date material which is 50,000 years in age or younger. Now we also have thorium and uranium, which are two radioactive elements which I'm sure you've probably heard of. So in the case of uranium, we commonly use uh, uranium lead dating to date minerals. Uh, in the case of thorium, there's actually a few different methods we can use. There's thorium-thorium dating, there's thorium-uranium dating, and there's thorium lead dating, to name but a few. So thorium's quite a uh, quite a good uh, isotope for helping to date minerals as well. But most commonly, uh, the uh, radioactive decay series that we're going to use to date minerals will very commonly be uranium lead dating. And the reason for that is, is that the minerals that we're dealing with, most commonly the mineral zircon, will typically contain small amounts of uranium. And zircon's a very, very common mineral. And so this means when we take a sample of the rock we want to analyze and we extract the zircon from it, typically we will be able to get quite a few crystals. And obviously the more crystals you get from the sample, the more crystals you can analyze, and therefore the more accurate your data is going to be. Because typically the more data you have, the more accurate your result will be. If we're dealing with a, uh, a, a particular mineral that only you know forms one crystal in let's say a cubic meter of granite, well yes we can in theory date the rock using that particular crystal, however the first problem is, is we need to find it and the next problem is that with only one data point can we be certain about the accuracy of our number. And so we always have to bear that in mind. Typically, when we're trying to date a rock, what we want to do is we want to use a mineral which is relatively common. And a mineral like zircon is absolutely great because it is a relatively common mineral in igneous and metamorphic rocks. So providing you have the right mineral or minerals in your rock, you can produce a numerical age for it. The only real thing that's holding you back is whether you have the money to pay for the lab time. So is numerical dating uh, only helpful for getting an age for a sample? Well, the answer to that is no. There's also other things that we can do with numerical dating. And one of those is showing how a rock has evolved through time. Now, once again, as with all things when it comes to numerical dating, you need to be dealing with the right kind of rock and you need to have the right minerals which you can date. So this won't work for every single rock type. Now, on this diagram here, we have a diagram showing the evolution of a granite. So if we look over here on the y-axis, you can see we have temperature, which is increasing as we come up. And over here on the x-axis, we have age, which is increasing as we move to the right. So the first point on our graph here is a uranium lead age for zircon. Now, zircon is a mineral that very, very commonly forms when a felsic magma cools down. So we know there's going to be lots of zircon in our granite. Now, another thing about zircon is that it's one of the last minerals to form when a felsic magma cools down. So we know that the, the, uh, the appearance of the zircon is going to represent the very, very, very last stages of the, of the felsic magma turning into a granite. And so we can use the zircon uranium lead age to say, right, this is the, this is the date at which our granite fully solidified. So it was 100% solid minerals and there was 0% magma left. So the great thing about zircon, as I've mentioned, is it's a very, very common mineral. But another, and the reason that it's so helpful to us is because it contains the element zirconium. And the thing about zirconium is that it will very commonly substitute with uranium. And so in most zircon crystals, there will be a small amount of uranium present, and we can use that uranium to date the crystal. So, okay, so we get we get the age for our granite from the uranium lead dating of zircon crystals. 
Is that the only information we can get? Well, the answer is no. There are certain other dating methods that we can use which are actually temperature sensitive. And so, as you can see, if we were to come here to biotite, we know that uh, we can date biotite using a method called argon-argon dating uh, at temperatures at or below 300 Celsius. So at or below 300 Celsius, we can use argon-argon dating of biotite. So this means that when we analyze the biotype from our granite sample and we get an age from it using argon-argon dating, this tells us this is the point at which the rock reached 300 Celsius, because we know, you know that's the point when we can start using argon-argon dating. And so what we're doing is we're getting an age for when the granite first solidified, and we're getting an age to the point where the granite hit 300 Celsius in temperature, remembering, of course, it's completely solid at this point. And so what we have is we have a date range which it takes for which it took our granite to get from about 800 Celsius down to about 300 Celsius. So we can say, right, how long did it take that 500 Celsius temperature change to occur? We can also use argon-argon dating on other minerals such as feldspar, you know, at temperatures of 200 Celsius or less. And so once again, well, we can date our feldspar crystals in our rock using argon-argon dating. And this will give us a date for when the feldspars essentially dropped to below 200 Celsius in temperature. And so once again, we now have a date that says, right, this is the time when our granite reached 300 Celsius using argon-argon dating of biotite. And this is the time at which our granite reached 200 Celsius using argon-argon dating of feldspar. So you can see what we've done is we've produced a cooling curve for our granite, showing us how quickly or slowly our granite cooled after it fully solidified. And always remember, igneous rocks will always have to cool down after they solidify. So in the case of the granite, it becomes completely solid at about 800 or 750 Celsius, but it still has to cool down to the ambient temperature. So it's still got to drop down, let's say something like, you know, 600, 700 Celsius just to reach the ambient temperature. So we can use dating methods to show how this rock cooled down over time. And this particular method is very helpful for igneous rocks in particular. But once again, it requires you to have the right rock type and it requires you to have the right minerals which you can date to get this kind of information. So you can't use it for every single rock type. So for instance, you couldn't use this kind of method for something like a mudstone. It just wouldn't work because you don't have the right minerals present. All right. Thank you for watching, everybody, and have a good day.